So welcome everyone. My name is Lydia Boss and my pronouns are she, her, and I am a program co-director at Artist Trust. Thank you so much for being here tonight for IP for Creatives with Adan Jimenez. Before I turn the workshop over to Adan, I'd like to begin with our land and labor acknowledgements. So for our land acknowledgement, we acknowledge that we do statewide work and that land is done on work stolen from native and indigenous people. Our office is on Duwamish land and I too am currently on Duwamish land and recognize that they were the first people here and were forced to move. Understanding our work, excuse me, understanding our place in history and understanding how we can better support indigenous communities is ongoing work. And then for our labor acknowledgement, we acknowledge that we benefit from the prosperity of the United States, which was built on the labor of enslaved people. Please join us in expressing our deepest respect and gratitude for the descendants of those who built this country. Great, well, thank you so much again to all of you for being here tonight. And before I turn the workshop over, I just wanted to quickly introduce Artist Trust in case anyone on the call may not be super familiar with who we are uh, or what we do. Uh, Artist Trust is a nonprofit organization whose sole mission is to support and encourage individual artists of all disciplines uh, working across Washington state. And uh, we serve artists um, primarily through grants and professional development opportunities, much like what you're doing here with us tonight. So artists are truly at the center of our work. And again, we're so grateful that you're here with us. So at this time, I would love to introduce our wonderful instructor tonight, uh, Adan Jimenez. And Adan is the son of artists from rural New Mexico, which has given him a deep appreciation for the value of the arts in local communities. His law practice reflects this appreciation with a focus on intellectual property, specifically copyrights and trademarks, where he combines his love for the arts with his passion for the law. Adan volunteers in the communities with, excuse me, in the communities with kids in need for defense, an organization that assists unaccompanied minors with obtaining status in the United States and communities rise a nonprofit assisting other nonprofits with corporate governance. Additionally, he serves as treasurer for the Washington Lawyers for the Arts, an organization that works to provide legal aid to artists on the King County Bar and is on the King County Bar Association IP section as co-vice chair. Adan, thank you so much again for being here with us and the floor is yours. No problem, thank you for having me, Lydia. I really appreciate it. Um, so uh, I have a little presentation. Let's go on ahead. Uh, can I share the screen? Uh, let's try it. So uh, for this is uh, intellectual property for creatives. Um, first off, my a little bit about me. My name is Adon Jimenez. Uh, I go. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, for you, uh, for people who are visually impaired, I am a light-skinned male wearing a blue shirt. Uh, with a white background and uh, baskets hanging up behind me. I have brown hair. Um, uh, I guess my bat, you did a great job introducing me, Leah. So uh, yeah, basically I'm an attorney here in Seattle. I focus on intellectual property rights, maybe into, uh, copyrights, trademarks, and other kinds of trade secrets. I really have a deep passion for yards. I, I love it a lot. And I want to try to make sure that I can protect it and help artists protect what they spend a lot of their time doing. Um, I know how valuable that is. So before we go any further, let me just go on ahead and give you guys a disclaimer. This presentation is meant to be educational in nature. I can't give you individualized legal advice. If you have any questions, please feel free to chime in. I'm more than happy to answer them, especially uh, as we move forward into this material. There'll be some points where it will a, a question will arise. Please just raise your hand, turn on your video, even just blurt it out. Uh, I'd much rather deal with it in the moment so that way we can address it and kind of work through the problem together. That being said, it, I can't give any kind of legal advice. So if you have a specific situation, maybe um, address it as a hypothetical. Uh, understand that I can't advise specifically on your situation. You might need to talk to an attorney. Also, uh, because this is being recorded and because there are other people here, 
uh, there's no confidentiality that we would have. So just keep that in mind. Uh, that's why it's sometimes beneficial to go on ahead and seek a, an attorney. So moving on, this is kind of, I want to give you an overall idea of where we're going with this presentation. We're going to kind of start with patents and we'll move to trademarks, copyrights. And if we have some, uh, some time, we'll move into other intellectual property rights and the, we'll get there and it'll be kind of evident. So first off, patents. Patents protect inventions. Now, I'm, I'm really just kind of including this because it's beneficial to know. Um, you might run into something that is a patent as an artist. Usually patents don't apply to artists. It's because patents have five elements. Uh, these elements are uh, dealing with like, what is a subject matter of a patent, whether it's useful, whether it's new, whether it's something that somebody who, of the, the industry wouldn't just normally come up with and whether or not you can write it in a way that other people will be able to implement it. And they exclude certain rules like uh, scientific laws, like you can't patent gravity. Um, and just to let you know, these generally last for 20 years. Now, as I've kind of alluded to earlier, patents in the arts, usually patents are not the best mechanism for protecting artwork. And that's because uh, mainly two par, par, uh, oops, mainly two things. And that is there's a useful requirement usefulness requirement, which basically indicates that whatever you're developing as a patent has to be useful. It has to be be able to be employed. Now, uh, I understand that there might be some artists out there who are developing uh, crap and like furniture or other stuff that wouldn't necessarily qualify as a patent uh, because it would not be uh, novel, which is new, uh, something that is a requirement as well. And whenever you look at novelty, you for a patent, you look at the whole entire globe. So key takeaways, uh, uh, key takeaways for patents, uh, basically they protect inventions, not so much art. Um, they're good to know about. They're another like mechanism in the toolkit for protecting stuff, uh, protecting intellectual properties, but it's not necessarily as important for this discussion. Moving on, uh, I know we just ble blew through the first section really quickly. Uh, now we're going to kind of get into some meat and bones with some additional sections that will be a little bit more applicable to these uh, to your situations as far as I'm aware. Um, for starters, we're talking about trademarks. Uh, trademarks are a designation for a source of goods or services. So what is a trademark? Well, it's commonly called a mark, and it's designated to use a source, as I said, uh, indicates a source of goods or services, and it lasts as long as the mark is used in commerce. So that means if you start selling something with a trademark, you can have it theoretically indefinitely. You can have it until the end of time, as long as that trademark or that good is being used in commerce. Now, there are different strengths. And it depends on the mark itself. So we have, there's basically four different kinds. There's generic, which is something that is so just ubiquitous that there's not really going to be a, a way to distinguish that it is yours. There's descriptive, which basically means that it's kind of describing what is happening. So you have like Joe's hardware store would be descriptive because it's the hardware store that belongs to Joe. They're not going to, generic and descriptive don't really have any kind of strength for trademark protections. They are very loose. Uh, then you have suggestive marks, which are marks that hint at what you're trying to do. And then you have fanciful or arbitrary. And fanciful or arbitrary marks are marks that are no way connected to um, the goods or services that you are providing. So uh, I just want to see if anybody out there is, does anybody have a trademark in mind that they kind of want to discuss? Any ideas? Somebody give me an example of like a fanciful or arbitrary mark. Okay, usually my go-to for this one is uh, Amazon. Uh, Amazon's really, in, uh, Amazon's a river in South America. And it doesn't really have anything to do with shipping or logistics. 
or selling books. So that kind of marriage between something that is sub incredibly abstract and something that uh, is a service that you're performing is kind of crucial for obtaining the strongest trademarks. Now, you guys are asking, why am I talking about trademarks? Um, and I will get to that in a little bit. There's a slide on it, but I guess as a little preview, the reason why is because you can have trademarks in names. And this is really important because you can go on ahead and if you are producing work under a studio, you can go on ahead and trademark your name. And this allows you some protection over the goods and services that you are providing. Uh, so that way you can prevent people from being your stuff. Um, and basically the way the, you, uh, the pat U.S. Patent and Trademark Office handles the names is they ask that the individual who has basically the rights to the name just sign off and approve it. And so you end up with stuff like um, you can use your full name, like J.J. Abrams. You can use like one one of your, uh, what would it be? Um, not one of your names. Um, uh, sorry, there's a question in the chat. Uh, what if your name is very common? Well, what will happen is you'll go on ahead, you can apply to get your name trademarked, and you'll have to kind of, you'll probably include some disclaimers. And it's going to depend on how common your name is and whether or not your name kind of has become synonymous with you and the goods and services you provide, uh, like Oprah, Trump. Uh, Mr. T are some common or are some trademarks that are out there that are have the name recognition. Now, if you were to go up and you had, um, I don't know, Joe, that might be a little bit harder to trademark, uh, but you can go on ahead and if you continue doing your work and let's you know, say Joe makes ceramics and you go on ahead and you have Joe's uh, ceramics and you, you've sold it for over 10 years or over five years, then you can go ahead and present that evidence to the USPTO or the US Patent and Trademark Office and say, look, this has acquired something called um, secondary meaning. And the secondary meaning will kind of give you a boost and it will allow you to get trademark uh, ability. And so in some ways, it's just a matter of time and trying to show that your name or your studio has become synonymous with the materials that you are producing. Now, these are all really dealing with every trademark in existence. There are different types of trademarks. So there's confusion here. Uh, there's multiple layers here. So you can have different strengths in trademarks, and then you have different types of trademarks. And the first type is common law trademarks. Uh, common law marks are just marks that are not registered anywhere. So if the, if the hardware store down the street isn't registered anywhere, you can continue to use, it uses its name to sell goods, then it will go on ahead and acquire some, some rights. Uh, you'll probably see usually artist studios that go on ahead and are organized under an artist will have the main artist's name as like a trademark and kind of be able to function as such. The second level is something called a state trademark. Uh, a state level trademark will function as a protection within the bounds, the geographic bounds of the state. So in Washington state, it costs like 55 bucks. Uh, you can go on ahead and get a trademark in that in the state of Washington. Now, I also want to make clear that the way trademarks distinguish it kind of they draw arbitrary lines in terms of goods classification. So they say, hey, you are making clothing and that's going to be different than you are making art. And so you need to be able to distinguish between whether you're making clothing, whether you're making art, you kind of like go for, go from there and determine whether or not what you're doing is more one than the other. And that's important for an infringement evaluation. Sorry, this is a lot, uh, but yeah. Uh, so that's state level trademarks. And the then there's federal level marks. Uh, federal level marks basically are across the whole entire United States. Uh, they are a first come first serve kind of mark. It's whoever goes on ahead and registers first with the US, P, uh, US Patent and Trademark Office. Sorry, I should have spelled that out. And registration costs between 250 
and $350 per class. And that's where I was talking about with classifications, classification of goods. So even if you were an art school, you could go on ahead and give, uh, you could have a trademark in giving classes for arts. And that would, depending on how many classes you did, it would kind of vary for the registration costs. And then even though trademarks last indefinitely, they do require renewal. And it's after the first five years, you have to renew. And then every 10 year anniversary, you have to renew again. And so it's just something that you have to maintain. Also, what happens is trademark owners have to police their marks. And so this leads to trademark infringement. So what do I mean by police their marks? I mean, a trademark owner has to go through and make sure that there's nobody who's using their mark in a, a way that really causes consumer confusion. So whether a person who's going out and buying a, like a, a backpack that has a big Nike check on it is actually buying something from Nike or buying something from somebody else. And there's two ways that I like to look at this. The first one is direct infringement where somebody just blatantly copies a trademark. Uh, and the second way is by a confusingly similar mark. Uh, and so that would be something that seeks to either it is close enough to cause confusion or seeks to trade on somebody else's good name, or it's just, it's really fuzzy. And so it causes confusion by the consumer. Uh, an example of this is, I don't remember if uh, it was bad, bad coffee, bad Starbucks. That was something, it was a meme kind of thing. Uh, where somebody made a parody of Starbucks by going through and basically treating customers horribly. They tried to claim that it was a art installation, uh, but uh, the course eventually said that it's causing disparagement on the Starbucks mark, and so you need to stop. So now all of that being said, there's there are some freedom, there's some room to maneuver with trademarks. So one of, um, one of the ways that this is done is with a test called the Rogers test. Um, and basically it states that if there's no artistic relevance in the underlying work whatsoever, then there, you can go on ahead and use it. And this is derived from a, a, an, a lawsuit about a Ginger Rogers movie um, where basically somebody tried to make a movie about Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers wasn't involved in it. And so she got very upset and sued to prevent them from basically claiming her life. And the court went through, they did this whole analysis and they came out with this test. Now, the, this test, uh, this thing came out in like 1980s. So what is the relevance now? Uh, well, now you're getting somewhat similar cases out of the the new like new technology. So, uh, in I believe last year there was somebody who made something called fuzzy or furry bit Birkins. I don't know if you guys are familiar with them. They were he tried to make them as NFTs, but they're basically Birkin bags, which are are designer handbags, and he made them furry and sold them. Uh, as NFTs, and he tried to go on ahead and make the argument that they were part of the Rogers test, that they fell within the fair use and were basically freedom of speech under this test. Uh, the reason why I'm talking about all of this is because I don't know if any of you are uh, appropriation artists or artists that go on ahead and rely heavily on criticism of satire or parody or satire that might pull in some of these uh, trademarks. And so I wanna make sure that you understand that there is room for you to go on ahead and use some of the marks in a way that comments back on the mark holders. And if you have any questions about this, please go ahead and talk to a trademark attorney. Uh, you can also use it for, you know, just describing what the goods and services are and also to, to name who the goods and services belong to. Um, and, and so it, that, that's pretty simple. Like, well, no, it's not simple, but the last two are. And so I really want to focus now on what trademarks and the arts can kind of really bring up and how they kind of overlap and where they have a lot of significance. So 
first place is you can have trademarks in the name. So we've already kind of discussed this. We have Picasso has a trademark in his name. Taylor Swift actually has a trademark in her name. So this means that you can't have any kind of performing artists or musical acts that go on ahead and copy her name or are confusingly similar to her name. Uh, but it doesn't only in there, it also can include albums or phrases. So Lizzo came up with the one, well, in one of her lyrics, it's 100% that bitch. And she's gone through and applied for a trademark for that. And they, there's a decision out there that basically gives it to Lizzo. So uh, the same with uh, Taylor Swift's Evermore album. These are ways that they can go on ahead, and get protections for their intellectual property. These are creations that they have made. And it, the protection lasts for forever versus, I'll give you, uh, versus copyright, which is 70 years plus the life of the artist, which sounds like a very long time, but it, it's not as long as a trademark, which as long as Taylor Swift is selling or Taylor Swift's company is selling CDs, I'm sorry, not CDs anymore, uh, but MP3s, any kind of digital version of those albums, her work is protected. So it's a way to extend the longevity of your work. There is also a third way that uh, trademarks can interact with the arts, and that is trademarks can be for dom domain names. So if you have a website, you can go on ahead and trademark your website's name, which is really handy in that you want to prevent any kind of confusingly similar people or competition that comes up. You can do that in order to protect this, the security of your studio. So, well, kind of getting back to the question about the common name, you can kind of get it. There might be some ways that you can be creative uh, on how you apply for your trademark that allow you to potentially trademark the domain name of your studio um, and kind of go from there. That being said, one of the key, like the key takeaway is. Uh, a trademark has to be used in commerce. They, they, that's, their, that's their main point. That is what they exist to do is to designate goods or services in commerce. Um, and so does anybody have any questions on trademarks? Just thought I'd throw it out there. I have a question, please, going back to patents. Just a quick question. Yep, go uh, for it, shoot. Oh, thank you. Uh, would you uh, explain enablement, please? Enablement? Yeah. Enablement is simply the ability of somebody to take your patent that you've written out and recreate that patent. Does that make sense? Um, somewhat, yes. So I guess in a patent, what happens is you go on ahead, you write everything out, and you come up with, usually it's one sentence that, that kind of describes it. And it says, you know, this bolt is going to be connected to this bolt and then this pipe and everything. So then you have this super large diagram. And somebody can theoretically go through and make all of that uh, if they follow your instructions. It's kind of like a Lego kit. Oh, yes. That's very clear. Thank you. OK. Okay, uh, and then there's a question about what is the minimum requirement to be considered in commerce? Um, that depends on what you're doing. If you're offering services, then sometimes simply advertising can be considered in commerce. If you are actually selling goods, then you need to have sales of goods. Um, there might be some arguments that basically say even advertising might not qualify. You need to go on ahead and actually perform your acts. Um, and so it just really, it really kind of, does that help answer the question, John? No, it's not really a, a clear answer there. Sure. So um, I guess the question is, is I've made art for many years. I've yet to sell anything. <laughs> Am, am I in commerce yet? <laughs> Are you offering it for sale? Um, I'm sorry, what? Are you offering it for sale? Yes. Then yeah, I'd say that you're engaged in commerce. Okay. It's, well, and remember, I, 
like it might be a little bit different given your situations and facts, but if you are going on ahead, if you have shows, if you are trying to exhibit and trying to garner sales and you just haven't had any yet, then that, that's not necessarily, you're, you're still in, I, I take the opinion that you're still engaged in commerce or there's a fictional person who's doing all this stuff, then they are still engaged in commerce. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, moving on to copyrights. If we... I'm sorry. Can Go I for ask it. A question? Yeah. Um, I'm, a, I'm a new artist and I have sold um, some of my art and um, I don't know how to protect it if it's a patent or trademark, like when you sign it, if you sign it in the front or back, I don't know if it matters, but I'm interested in how do I protect the art? Because um, I have a situation where someone mentioned that they were interested in my art and I said, oh, really? And I just kind of just sent them a print, but I never did hear back from, and I don't know, I know you said to probably get an attorney, but would a patent protect my art? So actually we are just, you couldn't have provided a better segue because we're going to get to the part that I feel is the best mechanism for protecting art. It's called copyrights. And copyrights okay. really provide you with a lot of protections for the underlying images. Now understand there are some limitations there, um, but if, if you go on ahead and you send somebody a poster, they, they can't sit there and make photocopies of it at FedEx because that's an infringement of your copyright. If you send somebody a JPEG via the internet instead of a poster, then they can go on ahead and they can use that in certain ways. They can't use it in other ways. And it kind of gets into a, a lot of situations. I, I guess the questions that would follow for, and I'm not really here to, to, I guess, did you send them a poster or did you send them uh, like a, a, a photo of the, your works? Uh, I sent them a photo of my work. Okay. Okay. So I, yeah. I'm not sure what what they did with it, but how do I protect myself? And, I, I, and then I thought afterwards, after that, I said, oh, I shouldn't, I don't know if I should have did that without, because no, I don't know what they what they did with it. You're in the right spot. We'll, we'll actually address all of these things and I can give you guys some tips and trips for how to ensure that your works are protected digitally. Uh, so that way it can, it can help. Um, uh, let me just make a note of that. Okay, but, I'll just listen. Uh, I mean, because okay. really what you're, yeah, that uh, if I haven't addressed your question by the end of this, please bring it back up. Uh, I, I want to help you out here. Okay, so, thank you. No problem. So copyrights. For starters, what is a copyright? There's a whole big statutory definition, but really what you need to know is it's an original work, a fixed authorship, and a tangible medium of expression. What does that mean? That is a mouthful. So we're going to go through and we're going to break this down a little bit. Um, and so we're going to start with what does an expression look like? And then we'll go on ahead and move on to kind of what is an original work. And the reason why is because I find that expressions are just a little bit easier to wrap our heads around. So what does an expression look like? Well, well I guess part of my thing is uh, already up there. But a, an expression can be a writing. It doesn't have to be any kind of fancy writing. It can be a little note from a kindergarten kid to uh, you. That is an expression. That is a written expression. Uh, it can be a drawing. It doesn't have to be any kind of fancy drawing. It can be just a regular drawing. Uh, it can be your kid's drawing that they did in art class. That is an expression. Uh, a video. So it, basically any kind of visual representation of things moving around. And this is where the, the fancy definition goes through and kind of like says with the aids of machines and everything. That is basically so you can say, okay, a video is considered an expression. It can be a performance, and this is where we get to Taylor Swift and uh, her shake it off. Um, it can be instructions on how to perform, and this is 
mu written music. And there, the reason why this is important is because there are different rights that can happen at different in the same work. And so we'll kind of touch on this a little bit later when we start talking about the rights that are included in every kind of work. Uh, it can also include architectural designs. And it can include sculptures. Basically, it's a really big list. And it's almost easier to sit here and say, what is not a copyright? And so a copyright is not a process, an idea, a system, a method of operation, a concept, or a discovery. And so as long as you're kind of out of those realms or in uh, scientific laws, uh, or out of scientific laws, you're probably living in an expression. And so I do want to highlight something here, and that is copyright is not an idea. You cannot sit here and say, I have an idea for this one painting, and this is what it's going to be. That is not copyrightable. Your expression of that idea is copyrightable. Does that make, does that track? Do you guys kind of understand the differences there? And it might be a little bit simpler here in a second, because what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what an original work is. So an original work is created by a person. Uh, and what if the work was made by a computer? That's AI, and we're seeing that kind of come to the surface. Uh, but what happens if it was made by a chimpanzee? Uh, there was actually a court case about a monkey selfie, who uh, a, self, a monkey who took a photo of himself. And the question is, is that actually, who owns the rights to that? Does the monkey own the rights to that? Or does the, the photographer who owned the camera? Or is it just uh, uh, out there in the world? Uh, something called public domain, but we'll get to public domain a little bit later. So remember when I talked about created copyrighted ideas? Well, this I think is a great idea of, or a great way to demonstrate how copyrighted ideas work or how ideas are different than expressions. And it's with uh, an AI generator. So I'm hoping, do you guys see? I oh, know you do not. We, we see it. Oh, you see the, I'm sorry. Okay. Do you guys want to give me a prompt for, oh, darn it. Do you guys have a prompt for a computer generated idea? Come on, give me, a, give me an idea. Let's work with something. Mm. Is my mic on? I'm sorry. Watermelon disco. Okay. So, does everybody have an idea of what a watermelon disco looks like in their head? So now we're gonna generate four images of a watermelon disco. And I'm willing to bet that none of these images are going to be like what you imagined, and none of these images are gonna be the same. So this kind of goes on ahead and exemplifies how work is original and how you can have the same kind of idea. <laughs> okay, I, I like this. Uh, but it can be represented in different ways. And that's one of the beautiful things about copyrights is you are you have the ability to have all of these different representations present. And that's why we don't go on ahead and specifically require uh, allow the copywriting of an expression or an idea. You need to be able to have, or yeah, the underlying expression. You can have these tangible expressions of media copyrighted like nobody if we go went on ahead and said oh we want to make this one right here that's going to be our art that's uh, that's going to be copyrightable but the idea of watermelon disco is not so we're jumping back to the the presentation and i kind of want to take it a slight, slight detour because we kind of talked about it and that's copyright and ai uh i want to go on ahead and be, give an even more something disclaimer about uh, this is based on the current guidance from the U.S. Copyright Office, which came out, I believe, in March. Basically, what they're doing is they're looking at a historical example, which is photography. 
So up until 1865, uh, copyrights were not part of the Copyright Act. They were not protected. And then you have to understand copyrights protections have been around since the Constitution. They were actually in, in what was it? They are part of the Constitution, uh, which was in 1776. So we're looking at 90 years where photography was not considered uh, a protected expression. Now, it had to be developed during that time, and photography kind of rode up. But it wasn't really until that date that they were even considered potentially artwork. And it wasn't really even until this case, a seminal case for copyrights called uh, Burrow Giles versus Sarney um, in 1882 that they went on ahead and it was the Supreme Court who basically said, yes, photography is a type of art form. And so you need to go on ahead and extend the protections to it. And really the Burrow Giles case is a case about uh, somebody who took a photo of Oscar Wilde and Oscar Wilde sat there and claimed that he owned the rights to the photo and that he could do with it as he wanted. Uh, and the Supreme Court came back and said, I'm sorry, but that's not really how that works. The photographer has to do a whole bunch of stuff where they go on ahead and they do handle the lighting, the composition, how much exposure to give to the film. They are really, really involved with how the, the image looks. And so they should be credited with that protections, the, those rights. And so really what's happened is the U.S. Copyright Office has come back and said, we're going to base a lot of our ideas and handling of AI and AI-created works um, in a similar way. We're going to say it really depends on the amount of work that a human has put into the expression. And whenever you go on ahead and you register the Work, you have if you've used any kind of AI generating machine or AI, AI generating content, you have to disclaim what you created and what the machine created. And depending on how much a person has created, uh, that'll depend on the strength of the copyright. If it's something as simple as a one line prompt, then there's going to be a lot less in terms of copyrightability and copyright protections that are going to be encompassed in that that work that is uh that is there at the USPTO or I'm sorry at the US uh, copyright office so I'm sorry I digressed into copyright and AI and now we're back to what are really copyrights so it's actually set out in the statute and there's a statute and they give you six enumerated rights and these six enumerated rights are the rights to reproduce the rights to reproduce prepare derivatives, to license, to perform publicly, to display publicly, and to transmit via electronic means. So not all works will have all of these rights. Um, for instance, you couldn't really perform a drawing publicly. I guess you could perform a drawing publicly, but it would be a performance work, not necessarily a drawing work at that point. Um, but you, and so some of these works have multiple, some of them have specific rights in them and some of them have multiple rights included in them so you remember that taylor swift uh clip that we saw earlier where or i tried to play earlier and it didn't work what you have in a performance like that you have multiple rights you have the rights of taylor swift doing um so we'll, we'll call it her performance so performing the work publicly but then you also have the rights to uh license the work available on youtube you have the rights to the underlying music that are being reproduced there. Then you also have the rights to transmit the work uh, and the performance publicly via electronic means. So you have a lot of rights that can suddenly come into play and it's keeping track of all of those that becomes very, very important. And also understand that you can have violations of specific rights. Uh, usually what happens um, is that there will be a, a situation in which you, if somebody violates one of the rights, uh, then it will become violating multiple rights. Okay, John, you are hitting it out of the ballpark. Uh, when does it become transformative? This is a this is a big question. This is a question that the Supreme Court last week came down with a decision on, uh, and it's regarding fair use and 
Can we put a pin in this question until we get to fair use by chance? Uh, I promise I will address it because it is, that is the age old, age old question is when is it no longer going to become, when is it no longer derivative and when does it become transformative? And when we start, let's, let's hold off on the discussions on that and I will not forget the question, uh, I promise. Uh, as to the caller's question regarding how to protect her works, um, these are all the rights that are automatically or that come with copyright protections. So I guess what is required for copyright protections? Um, how many of you have heard of the old adage of mailing yourself a certified envelope containing a copy of the work? Usually it's like a, a song that's sitting there and you write it all up and you stick it in a self-certified envelope and you send it to yourself in the mail. Um, does that secure a copyright? Can we might get a show of hands, any kind of indication? Anybody? Yeah? So actually, that doesn't. What happens is all works automatically get copyrights. Uh, from 1976 onwards, all works have copyrights in them. The key here, the difference is registration. And so what the US Copyright Office wants is they want you to register your works with them. Uh, they are part of the Library of Congress. Usually the cheapest registration is a single author registration. It's 45 bucks. Um, if you go on ahead and do the re normal registration, I think it's like 65. There is something that does uh, account for the timeliness of registration. And so timeliness is dealing with uh, when a work has been published. And published means just like sent into magazines and published on the, in, in a magazine. Um, if you file within three months of publication, it is considered timely. Um, and you really want to go, go on ahead and get timely registration because that allows for some something called statutory damages and attorney's fees. And the other thing that bringing the registration allows for is uh, actually bringing in a, a case for infringement of a copyright. And statutory damages, the, so ask the owner of a copyright, if you ever pursue an infringement action, you will have Yeah, okay, John, I got gotcha. you. Yes, if somebody has a, a hundreds of works, it is a lot of money. Sorry, uh, John asked the question of what should someone with hundreds of works do? That's a lot of money. So there are a multitude of options here. There are something called group registrations, which depending on the type of work that you have, it's a limit of 10 works per grouping, or if you have images, it's an, a limit of 750 images that can all be grouped into one filing. And groupings, I believe, cost under $100. So yes, that, that helps reduce some of the costs. The other thing to do would be to select the works that you feel are uh, prime for, for um, infringement, which is kind of a little bit of a whack-a-mole. The other thing you can do, I, I don't know what kind of work you're doing, John, but you can also, if you're, a photo, if you're a photographer, you can wait until works get published and then like once a quarter, go on ahead and file a group registration based on the published works. The works that are not published are, uh, you can wait to go on ahead and get timely registration on until they become published or until you need to bring suit because then they will always be timely um, because they have not been published. Um, does that answer the question? I'm hoping it does. If not, I, I don't, I, it's unfortunate and they need to come up with a better system, but I, so far it's, it's getting better it's slowly, slowly, slowly. Um, so yes, registration allows for you to bring suit and it allows for statutory damages. Statutory damages at the minimum are $700 at the maximum $30,000 per infringement. Then if you go on ahead and you can prove willful infringement, that goes up to, it can be up to $150,000 per infringement. So the cost of actually registering sometimes is drastic, I, in my opinion, is drastically outweighed by the cost of um, any kind of infringement. So theoretically, if you go through and even if, if you can basically for 50 bucks, for $65, 
you register one of your works, you can have the statutory damages even at the minimum of 700. That's uh, approximately 10 times as much. Uh, and it would cover all of your attorney's fees. Uh, the attorney's fees would have to be upfront or you'd have to work with an attorney on a contingency basis. And that really depends on the attorney themselves and kind of your agreements there. Uh, but the there's a lot of uh, potential to be made and there's usually uh, some sort of agreement that can be worked out prior to filing suit uh, that would potentially uh, compensate you for your work. So I would be remiss for not mentioning something about works for hire. Uh, works for hire are commissioned works. And understand that if you are an artist who receives a commission to like do a drawing or do a painting for somebody, then there's some rules here. And it it belongs to, oh, I'm sorry, this is incorrect. Uh, if the owner, if the contractor goes on ahead and drafts something and provides it to the, the so a contractor goes through, draws something for an owner. Unless there's a written agreement, the owner will, or the contractor will own those rights in the image. Uh, that being said, if there's an employee and the employee draws something as part of their, their job, then that would become part of the, the, the entity that belong, the employee belongs to. Uh, and there's a different terms in terms of duration for these works for hire. Works for hire only lasts 95 years, which is different than the 70 year, uh, the life of the artist plus 70 years. So yes, uh, works for hire, please be aware that they exist. You probably interact with them uh, a lot if you ever receive commissions for your art. Um, copyright in the arts. Um, this is, I feel pretty obvious. This is the most direct way to protect any kind of expression that you are making. Um, the, and it runs the gamut. It runs from going on ahead and Produce uh, protecting some somebody from making dance steps that are very similar to your dance steps. Uh, and as we saw, there have been cases regarding somebody pulling dance moves and using them in a game, and then that resulting in some sort of uh, copyright claim. Uh, it can result in uh, I don't know how many people here code, but it can be, it can result in code violation, um, computer violation computer copying uh, situations, which are very complex and can potentially lead to infringement. I know that's not really dealing with the arts, but uh, digital arts is something as well. Uh, and basically, you think of it in a different way. In, exp in most things, there's an expression. And so it's a matter of trying to capture the expression and moving on. That being said, so we, John brought up transformative, and there that's kind of leading into fair use. Now, most of the time, fair use, let's go ahead and set out what's happening. Fair use is set out by statute. There's a four-factor test. Uh, this is the purpose and character of the use, uh, including whether it's commercial nature or nonprofit educational purposes, uh, the nature of the copyrighted work, the quantity and quality of the portion used and the effect on the potential market for the valued, the value of the copyrighted work. Sorry about that. And all of those four factors are taken and they're balanced and they're looked at and courts really do this facts, fact intensive analysis to try to determine whether the use is fair. And by fair use, it means it's an excused use. It's an affirmative defense. Now, recently the court went through and in the Warhol, Get the exact name of it, but in the, a case surrounding Andy Warhol's use of Prince's image, they looked at whether or not the first factor here, the purpose and character of the use, uh, including its commercial nature, is transformative. Uh, and transformative courts have kind of come to a determination that transformative means it's being used for a use other than the use of the original. Uh, and so they're looking at it and they're saying, well, does it fill that need? 
And it's really interesting, especially in this, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna nerd out for a second. Uh, it's really interesting in this latest uh, court case because what they did is they really looked at the markets that were being served, which potentially goes on ahead and subsumes the fourth factor of the fair use analysis. Uh, so there might be some room for interpretations there, and it might just be that a lot of the fair use analysis is becoming solely based on the first factor and whether or not the purpose and character of the 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 reproduction is deemed to be transformative and deemed to no longer compete with the original work or uh, is functioning separately. That being said, if you do, there are some caveats here. Um, one of the main caveats is parody. Parody is a transform is a transformative use in the fact that it uses the original work to pinpoint some stuff, highlight it, and then look back on it and say, okay, this is something that we can do. Uh, this it, parody usually provides commentary on the specific work uh, versus satire, which provides commentary on uh, society as a whole. And that's why one of the seminal cases is Two Live Crew versus um, A Cough Rose, which was discussing Pretty Woman and uh, Two Live Crew's crude ass uh, determination of uh, Roy Orbison's classic uh, song. And I do want to highlight that fair use is different than public domain. And public domain is works that have been around long enough so that the life of the artist and plus 70 years has expired or the 95 years for uh, works for hire. And basically that means that it is fair game. Anybody can use it. There are no requirements there. Um, John, did that answer your question on transformative use? Or what is transformative? So uh, what I'm curious about is like, if you look at the, uh, during the Obama election, there was that image of Obama that was uh, reduced in colors. Uh, or um, uh, say if you take uh, a photograph and you um, like blow up to just part of it and then you begin to abstract on top of it until it's almost unrecognizable. So what, what kind of boundaries, you know, when you transform something uh, or, or say, for instance, say a photo that is used in a magazine, but then you then make a painting off of it. So the painting is an individual uh, instance of something that looks very different from the photo. Is that something where you're crossing any lines? Okay, so there's a lot of questions there. Let's break it down. The Obama poster, I know that there was some litigation about. I don't remember what that was off the top of my head. Uh, if you're going on ahead and you're taking images and you are taking them to the point of abstraction to where nobody can recognize it, then I would make it, I would argue that that is definitely transformative. You're taking it and you're, you've gone on ahead and you've made it into something completely new. Um, as far as taking and shifting from one space to another space, that's not, that can be transformative. There's a little bit of wiggle room there, but it's very context dependent. And it also depends on what kind of markets you're looking at and whether or not those markets are gonna be um, competing. Uh, so, the things that, that come to mind are, I know that there are some cases out there about transforming uh, holiday cards onto holiday ornaments. And sometimes it's allowed, sometimes it isn't. So it, it also depends on whether or not you're taking that image that you, from one, one medium to another medium and really uh, taking the kind of the same treatment as the other, uh, the other matter, uh, the other, example that you gave and taking it all the way to abstraction. If it's just a simple one-for-one -one copying, then I'd make an argument that that's probably derivative use. And, and so uh, a violation of the copyright of the original. But if you take it and you abstract it and you do some more work to it, then that goes on ahead and uh, creates much more transformation. And, and I mean, it also, if you look at the other factors of the fair use analysis, it kind of like can provide you with some, some information there. Uh, one of the other things is, yeah, and depending on the strength of the original work, that can also determine how strong you, the fair use claims are. Does that make sense? Okay. So the key takeaway I have for this one, uh, if you don't remember anything else, I would advise that you register any works for copyright protections. 
Um, and that's simply because the cost of going through, I know it's a lot of money to do this if you have hundreds of works, but I would select, I would say select works, select works that are published um, and try to get them registered because the amount of return is drastically higher than the cost of going on ahead and doing it post, uh, post infringement. Um, so I do have, and I know that's the end of the, the big three, but I do have some other intellectual property laws that might come into play uh, for you guys. And it, I thought it would be beneficial to touch on just because uh, they're kind of like bonus works. So for starters, I want to talk about trade secret laws. So does anybody have any idea on what trade secret laws are? Formula for Coke? Yep, you got it. That's the best example ever. Um, and so they are secrets that are legally protected. And really there are two things that you have to do. You it has to be commercially beneficial and you have to take steps to keep it a secret. So the reason why this, I'm even talking about this, you guys, is there may be things that you're not even thinking of that might be available for trade secret protection such as uh, a ceramicist uh, glaze recipes. Um, painters, if you have a specific way that you treat your paints, uh, I don't know, can you guys think of any other potentially, without giving anything away, but something that would also be, uh, something that you would very, very much value. Okay, well, and the interesting thing about trade secrets, and I mean, the idea of the Coca-Cola recipe is kind of uh, very key to this, is it covers things that are not patentable. So you couldn't really patent the formula for Coke because it's just a mixture of chemicals um, and it's gonna be obvious. And it's, I mean, sure it's useful, but you couldn't really patent it. So this covers that, that, pro that provides a way to make it something that nobody else can get to. And I do want to point out that there are some limitations to this, and that is that there, uh, if somebody else goes through and develops it independently, then that's fine. Uh, they can also reverse engineer whatever it is that you do. Um, one of the things that would be beneficial is if you are one of these people who might uh, need some trade secret protections, going ahead and, and, and it sounds so weird, but to have like, uh, anybody who works in your studio sign a NDA whenever they get hired on, just because it will, you have to take those affirmative steps to keep your secrets. And uh, uh, an NDA is a non disclosure agreement. You can also do it with a confidentiality agreement. And basically, it's there just to paper your protections. And it gives the, you a leg in court whenever you get there to say, look, I took this stuff very seriously. I worked very hard to protect my 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 secrets, and I even had them sign these things. Um, and then another one that is also really really beneficial here, and actually we are in a very interesting place is rights of publicity. Uh, they vary by state, uh, and fortunately for us, uh, Washington State is one of those that actually protects rights of publicity. Um, it's in basically every individual uh, has the rights to their name, voice, signature, photo, likeness. Uh, now also understand this can be passed on through inheritance. It doesn't have to be just your individual personal rights. You can also do like um, personas. So like Hulk Hogan could be passed on through his inheritance and could be considered for these rights of publicity. Um, uh, I, I guess um, Hulk Hogan being a, uh, a pseudonym, uh, Mr. T is the same kind of idea. Uh, you have these rights and they can be passed on, they can be protected. Now, this can also function as a, kind of when we were talking about trademarks and trademarking names, this can also kind of function in that area as well uh, as a way to protect what your work is. Um, understand that it is very limited and it, it only applies to you and it applies to your name. 
but that's really beneficial. The other thing that's really nice about this is that it goes on ahead and in, it, it's not for only individuals who are famous. It's for individuals who basically every day are individuals. Every individual who's a, state, a citizen of the state of Washington has these protections. And so with that, I, I, are there any other questions? Okay. Um, I don't know what. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, yes, I wanted to talk to you about metadata and having uh, watermarks on copyrighted photos. Okay, so under the, the the Copyright Act, there's a defense that basically says, "Hey." I didn't know that I was infringing your works. And one of the ways that you can prevent this defense from coming up is by including a watermark on your images. Now, the way the code is written, it says, if you go on ahead, this uh, a watermark can be just on the front, but it can also be in the uh, metadata for the images. It also goes a long way to proving the, uh, the ownership of the images. Usually whenever there isn't a registration, the metadata uh, fits in and serves as that rule and serves that function. So I would highly encourage you to go on ahead and watermark and include in any of your metadata uh, your your information, your copy. Even if you just go on ahead and mark it with uh, that little C in the circle, uh, go on ahead and do that. It is 100% very smart to do. And uh, it is a no cost method for moving forward with that. As far as putting photos up on the internet and social media, uh, there are those are two different questions. So the internet, if you have a website uh, that you can go on ahead and host your photos on, I'd say go on ahead and do it. You there, you I would advise that you go on ahead and include in the metadata all of your contact information, all of your copyright protection, uh, copyright notices basically, which include the copyright symbol, your name the date of creation and uh, just leave it at that. And I believe it maybe if you put your email address in there, that would also be beneficial. Um, go on ahead and do that. If you go on ahead and use any kind of, yes, sign uh, signature on a painting is enough metadata. Uh, paintings are old school. They don't really have the, the spot to put all that information on there. Uh, but yeah, signature, um, I'm trying to think if the copyright symbol needs to be on there. I don't believe so. And understand that these are all ways to provide notice to anybody in the world that this is your image. And so a signature on a painting, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, John's asking if a signature is enough on a painting is enough metadata or on, on an image of a painting? Uh, yes, uh, on both of those, because the difference we're talking about here is we're talking about the difference between physical space and digital space. The amount of information that is contained in digital space is vast, is a lot greater in some ways than the information that is contained in physical space. Whereas physical space, we're limited to only the two-dimensional Form. Uh, in digital space, uh, basically, we can hide stuff in the packets that are around the image. Uh, as far as internet usage, I would definitely go on ahead if you use anything like Flickr or Instagram. Uh, we'll stick with Flickr or any other kind of image hosting website. I would advise that you read the terms of service uh, because sometimes what you do with those is you grant them a non-exclusive license to go on ahead and use your works. Um, so they will go on ahead and in exchange for hosting your images, they will provide them to anybody. This is true for social media. It's where if you go on ahead and you upload an image to social media, you are providing that image to social media for a non-exclusive right, uh, a non-exclusive license to use that work. Uh, usually this covers like the idea of going through and reposting images, 
but it can also theoretically be interpreted to turn like in five years, if Meta determines that Instagram is no longer making a profit, they can say, well, you granted us a non-exclusive license to use works. We're going to change uh, Instagram into the new Getty and it's a photo stock agency now. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, based on my last reading, which I will say has been about a few years ago, those that was kind of allow, allowed under um, Instagram's previous terms of services. I, I caveat that with saying it's been a while since I've read Instagram's terms of services, but that would be something to watch out for. Um, that being said, um, you have... I also understand there's this tension between exposure and protecting your work. And so you have to figure out which way to go and how to do that. Uh, and so really it's up to you on how you can try to get the exposure that you need using social media, uh, where you do, where you are basically sharing all of your content, all the stuff that you work really, really hard to create. And at the same time, making sure that it doesn't have, it doesn't, um, you don't, what is it? You don't give away the farm at the same time. Um, so yeah, that's that's uh, an interesting point in the, the world of digital AI and or digital copyrights and digital Im images. Uh, any other questions? So the whole idea from the watermark came from the prior Copyright Act. It used to be that you had to put a notice on your copyright copyrighted work before you got any kind of protections. And you couldn't put a notice on it if it wasn't registered. And so back in the day, there were it was a lot harder to maintain copyright registrations. And so with the 1976 Act, what happened was is Congress went through and they tried to streamline it and try to make it a whole lot easier for individuals to um, to get protections and to fall in line with international copyright law, which was uh, contained in the Berne Convention, which basically says, hey, everybody's going to be treating copyrights very similarly. Um, that being said, yeah, that's where that came from. Um, oh, talking about little watermarks and everything. I forgot to mention during trademarks. Uh, you know that little R uh, on trademarks? You don't use it unless you have a registered trademark with the US Patent and Trademark Office. It is a federal offense. Uh, the way to get around that is to use the little TM. Uh, the little TM just basically connotates a state level trademark. Uh, the little R is a registered trademark. And so I want to make sure that I mentioned that at least. Adon, thank you so much for all of the information that you've shared tonight. I've learned a ton and really appreciate you being here with us. No problem. I'm glad I can help. I, I would love to sit here and answer any more questions if anybody has it. Um, but yeah, I, it's a lot of fun. It's really interesting to me. And I, I find this space fascinating. And yeah, whatever I can do to help out. Great, thank you so much. So for anyone who wants to hang on and ask any uh, last questions, uh, we'll hang here for a little bit, but otherwise just wanna express gratitude. Thank you to everyone for being here with us tonight. Uh, this webinar will be available on our website and we will also email it to you uh, probably middle of next week. If you're looking for additional information about support for your work or grants through Artist Trust, please visit artisttrust.org and have a wonderful rest of your evening.